Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, and this is Last Week in the Church, the show where we harvest the fruits of the journalistic enterprise of the last week on the Vatican and Global Church Beat. Here's what we've got for you on this week's menu. We begin with Return to Cinder. A senior official of the Ukrainian government basically tells Pope Francis to buzz off with regard to his recent comments in praise of Great Mother Russia. We will explain what's going on there and what the potential fallout might be. Secondly, the handwriting is on the wall, how the Vatican's packaging of the recent discovery of a piece of anti-fascist graffiti in the Secretariat of State reflects a concern for papal legacies, not merely in the past, but also potentially in the future. Third, a modest proposal. We are now three weeks away from the curtain going up on Pope Francis's keenly anticipated and likely to be massively contentious Synod of Bishops on Synodality. I have a proposal to make about punditry with regard to the Senate, which I am completely convinced absolutely nobody is going to accept, but I'm going to make it anyway. Fourth up this week, a family affair how the recent beatification of an entire Polish family simultaneously highlights in a way the best and the worst of the Catholic past. And then finally, finding a home. A senior spokesman for Opus Dei indicates that in light of recent legal revisions by Pope Francis, the Catholic organization may need to find a new home under church law. All of that and more is waiting for you this week. So please, in the name that of all of all that is decent in this world, and you know, frankly, also my own traffic numbers, don't go anywhere. Stay where you are. We've got a great show. I will be right back. So notoriously, intelligence and wisdom are not the same thing. It is actually possible to be incredibly smart and also incredibly foolish. Footnote, it is also possible to be a total idiot and a great fool. My life is sort of a laboratory experiment in what happens when both of those things are true. But that's not our point here today. Our point here today is that history is replete with examples of the great mischief that can result when intelligence and wisdom become decoupled. If you want a refresher course in this point, by the way, I recommend you go see the brilliant new movie Oppenheimer, which is basically a three-hour meditation on precisely this point. However, the contrary is also true. That is, if disaster is often the result when intelligence and wisdom separate, triumph and amazement is often what happens when intelligence and wisdom come together. And this is a roundabout setup for a naked commercial plug, because I'm here today to recommend a new piece of technology to you. It's a new app called Magisterium AI. And basically, it is an effort to combine intelligence, in this case artificial intelligence, with the great spiritual and ethical wisdom of Catholic teaching. It is an app that is by now trained on more than 3,000 official church documents. It is available in 10 languages, so pretty much any tongue you would, you know, wish to get an answer in. And what you can do is you can go on to this app and ask it questions ranging from really high-end egg-headed stuff to like explain the doctrine of transubstantiation, or what were the issues in the Arian heresy, all the way down to the kinds of banal things that real people would ask, like, what's the deal with the Pope? Or, you know, the Virgin Mary, do you guys worship her? Like, what's the thing? You know, whatever your question is, this tool will give you cogent, insightful, well-written answers. So whether you are a priest who needs talking points for a homily, or you're a CCD teacher who has that one precocious kid in class that won't stop asking you questions, and speaking as the former precocious kid in class, I know how annoying that slice of life can be. I raised it to a fine art. Whatever, you know, whatever your needs may be. I mean, if you're just an ordinary person with questions about the Catholic Church, because, I don't know, you read a Dan Brown novel, or you watched Godfather 3, or whatever it is, This tool will be extraordinarily useful to you. It is the brainchild 
of our friends at Longbeard. That's a digital marketing and design company. They are the IT backbone of the Crux site and also of last week in the church. These people are geniuses. And beyond that, they're also salt of the earth, great people. And so whatever they touch basically turns to gold. This is the latest example of it. I highly recommend it to you. Now, I'm not going to promise that if you, you know, use it, and by the way, you should, it's at magisterium.com. That's magisterium.com. I'm not going to promise you a full refund if you're not satisfied because it's free. So you don't actually have to pay anything. What I will promise is that if you don't like it, you are free to send me a note telling me that. I will use another AI app to generate an automated response in which I have no role whatsoever. I'm actually just kidding. I would pass your response along because I guarantee you the people at Longbeard want to get this right. So again, check it out. That is Magisterium AI online at magisterium.com. By the way, if this didn't convince you, and frankly, it's me, so why should it convince you? But if you want a more intelligent presentation of the argument for this, read my wife Elise's article on the Crux site. It is replete with insight and elan and verve, and it will lay out the case in very compelling fashion. Magisterium.com, check it out. Hello, everybody. Happy Tuesday to you. Happy September 12th in the year of our Lord, 2023. <laughs> Sorry, took me a second. Yesterday, of course, was the anniversary of 9-11, a sobering reminder of the changed realities of the world in which we live. We begin this week, as I mentioned at the top of the show, with Return to Cinder, a new expression of what? Umbrage, unhappiness, heartburn, angst from Ukraine with regard to some recent comments by Pope Francis in praise of Russian culture, and I suppose more generally, upset with the line that Pope Francis has adopted on the war in Ukraine since its very beginning. So a senior advisor to President Vladimir Zelensky of Ukraine by the name of Mikhailo Podolak gave an interview this past week to a Ukrainian television network in which he was asked about comments Pope Francis recently made in a video conference with Russian Catholic youth gathered in St. Petersburg, in which the pontiff urged these young Russians to be conscious of their heritage as heirs of what he called Great Mother Russia. And he said that there is this great enlightened humanitarian culture of which Russia is a sort of crucible. He mentioned specifically uh, Catherine II, Peter the Great, and you know, basically told them to be proud of their heritage. Now, quite predictably, that did not go down especially well with many Ukrainians. A spokesperson for Ukraine's foreign ministry immediately said that the Pope was recycling Russian imperialist propaganda. The head of the Greek Catholic Church in Ukraine said that these comments had caused great concern and sorrow among Catholics. Now, the Pope, on his return flight from Mongolia, remember he was in Mongolia from August 31st to September 4th, took a question about these comments and sort of, well, I guess you could say he attempted to put out the fire, although obviously not terribly successfully. Uh, basically, what he said was that I wasn't praising imperialism, I was praising culture, and all these nice things about Russian culture is what we were taught in school. All of that brings us to this past week when Mikhail Podolak said, well, let me tick off the bullet points. Basically, A, that the Pope was pro-Russian. This is not a paraphrase, that's a direct quote. He said Pope Francis is pro-Russian. He then said that the Pope is not credible when it comes to the conflict in Ukraine. He flatly rejected any mediation role for the Vatican in this conflict, saying, that for the Vatican to act as a mediator or this Pope to act as a mediator would be to deceive both Ukraine and the cause of justice. And in fact, Podolak went so far as to suggest that the Pope may have been bought off. He said, we need to take a close look at Russian investments in the Vatican Bank. 
saying that deserves greater attention. The idea being, basically, that Pope Francis is serving as some kind of Russian stooge because Putin has driven a dump truck full of money up to his front door. Now, the truth of it is, anyone who knows anything about the reforms in the Vatican Bank over the last decade or so would know that that suggestion was, frankly, kind of, well, silly. The statutes of the Vatican Bank today make it abundantly clear that foreign governments, or, for instance, Russian oligarchs, cannot have accounts in the Vatican Bank. The only account holders are, you know, the religious orders or Catholic dioceses, other Catholic organizations around the world. The Vatican Bank actually put out a statement in regard to all of this, suggesting that this is all sort of nonsense. And, you know, I mean, the truth of it is there, there probably is no basis to the suggestion that Russia is somehow using its financial leverage to, you know, compel the Pope to take one position or another. But it is indicative, I suppose, of the degree of, well, what you might call the hermeneutic of suspicion through which Ukraine and Ukrainians now see what the Pope has, has to say about the conflict. Now, let's make two points about this. First of all, what the Pope had to say about Russian culture, quite honestly, is just self-evidently true. I mean, look, that there is a great humanitarian culture in Russia. I mean, think about Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and Chekhov and Tchaikovsky and, you know, Russian artists and writers and, and on and on and on and on and on. There really is no serious debate on this point. And so in that sense, at a sort of face value level, you know, what the Pope said tracks with reality. And, and of course, let's also note that when the Pope talks to people from any place, he tells them to be proud of their culture. I mean, the Pope was just in Mongolia. He told Mongolians to be proud of their culture. And I suppose if you were victims of Genghis Khan in the 13th or 14th centuries, you might not be so hot about that either, okay? but this is just what popes do. Because, you know, the pitch here is that you can be both a good Catholic and a good citizen of the place you come from. That's point one. Point two, it is also understandable, I suppose, that Ukrainians right now are not particularly in the mood to hear the Pope or anyone else praising the greatness of Russian culture when that kind of rhetoric is being used to justify the brutal invasion of their country. Obviously, the calculus of Pope Francis here is that by avoiding public excoriations of Russia or Putin, and by trying to maintain this appearance of being even-handed, that should the calculus on the battlefield change, and should Putin be interested in some kind of face-saving solution, then the Pope and his Vatican team could perhaps be useful in trying to bring this conflict to an end. Whether or not that's actually how it plays out, obviously remains to be seen. And in the meantime, Ukrainian frustration is probably understandable. I will note also that, ironically, the Greek Catholic bishops of Ukraine are in Rome right now. They are wrapping up a synod meeting. They had an opportunity to sit down with Pope Francis earlier this past week to talk about all of this. A statement they put out later suggested it had been a frank discussion. I'm guessing that probably is underselling it to some degree. All right, second up this week, the handwriting is on the wall. So a very interesting news item appeared on Vatican News. That's the official media platform of the Vatican this past week. It concerned the discovery of a previously unnoticed bit of graffiti in a room in the Secretariat of State. It used to be the private apartment of a very well-heeled cardinal. Today, it is a room where visitors sit around while they're waiting to be received by some official in the Secretary of State. And it has all of these like frescoes and friezes and other decorations in the room. Remember, most of the decorations in the Secretary of State, the Apostolic Palace, were performed by the Renaissance artist Raphael. Anyway, in this particular room, there are these etchings, there's a series of friezes on the windows that depict leaves, right? Like olive leaves or grape leaves. 
And it turns out that somebody had written in script that matched the color of these friezes in tiny little writing. They had written morte Mussolini, meaning roughly death to Mussolini. The reconstruction is that apparently in the period between 1943 and 1946, there were some restorations done to this artwork in the Secretary of State because over the centuries, a layer of lime deposits had built up and it had to be very carefully removed. The theory is that somebody probably wrote this little bit of graffiti while all that was going on. Now, what's interesting is that in the article published by Vatican News, which, by the way, was co-authored by the Vatican's editorial director, veteran Italian journalist Andrea Tornielli, who was more or less the official sort of guardian of Pope Francis's record and legacy, this article claimed that the graffiti illustrates and in a way confirms all of the efforts that the wartime pope, Pope Pius XII, had taken to defend the victims of persecution during the war. Now, here's the thing. We have no idea if that's actually true. We don't know who wrote this graffiti or why. And, and honestly, it is equally plausible that it was somebody at the time who was frustrated with what they saw as an overly cautious Vatican approach to Mussolini and the fascists and who were registering their displeasure. I mean, obviously, the fact that they went to great lengths to hide this, you know, amid these friezes on the windows in this room would suggest they didn't necessarily think the Vatican was going to be doing cartwheels of joy because they did this. So why, given the fact that the evidence doesn't really support that claim, why would it be important to Tornielli and the Vatican to frame it that way? Well, this is part of a broader effort that the Vatican has been engaged in in recent months to defend the legacy of Pius XII at every turn. You will, of course, be aware that Pius XII has been accused by some of being, quote-unquote, Hitler's pope the title of the famous book by John Cornwell, that is, of being excessively silent during the Holocaust and therefore, in a kind of roundabout way, somehow being complicit in the genocide of Jews and other populations during the Nazi reign of terror. Now, that, of course, is a claim that has been vigorously contested in multiple quarters. Among other things, many observers would point out that Pius XII was Pope from 1939 to 1958. Whatever you make of his conduct during the war, his entire legacy can hardly be reduced to that. Now, the issue, I suppose, would be, why is Pope Francis's Vatican so apparently determined to extol the legacy of Pius XII? And I would suggest part of it is just simple justice. Okay, I think there is a genuine conviction the Pius XII is a great pope who has been unfairly maligned. But part of it, too, I suspect, is the realization that 40, 50, 100 years from now, it is entirely possible that someone could accuse Francis of being Putin's pope, or, for that matter, of being Xi's pope, the reference being to Chinese Premier Xi Jinping in both cases. Pope Francis has been accused of being overly accommodating, overly silent, of glossing over massive violations of human rights, religious freedom, acts of aggression, and so on, for the sake of the diplomatic and institutional interests of the Vatican and the Catholic Church. And I think many guardians of Francis's legacy are worried that just as Pius was a pope who did a massive amount of things in every arena of Catholic life and who in his time was regarded as a moral hero, but has, with the passage of time, been reduced to the debate over this single aspect of his legacy, I think there is concern that something similar might happen to Pope Francis. And so this is, in a sense, a kind of preemptive strike. We will see whether in the courtroom of history that preemptive strike has the desired effect. All right, third up this week, a modest proposal. So on October 4th, the curtain will rise on Pope Francis, the first, really, of Pope Francis's keenly anticipated synods of bishops on synodality. Now, really, this is supposed to be a sweeping exercise 
in trying to make the Catholic Church a more listening church, a more participatory church, one in which the voices not simply of bishops, but also of clergy and religious and laity, both women and men, are all heard, and in which the various layers and strata and pockets of the church kind of journey together. Now, that said, it is quite likely that media attention is going to focus on a fairly narrow canon of contentious issues, which would include things such as married priests, the question of the ordination of women, particularly as deacons, and also the blessings of same-sex unions and, more broadly, outreach to the LGBTQ plus community. And these are, of course, deeply divisive questions in Catholic life. They are at least alluded to in the preparatory documents for this synod, and I think there is a fairly universal expectation that in some way, shape, or form they're going to come up. Now, when you talk to Vatican officials these days, what you pick up is a kind of climate of alarm that media coverage is going to play up these flashpoints, right? these fractures, to such an extent that it will get in the way of what Pope Francis really wants for this synod, which is a kind of exercise in seeking consensus. Now, much could be said about that, and frankly, whether or not things work that way, to a great extent, depend upon the Pope himself and the organizers of the synod, how open they choose to make this exercise, and how much they respect dissenting opinions. In other words, are they going to try to ram through certain preordained conclusions under the guise of a kind of fake or faux consensus? Or are they going to respect the complexity that is undoubtedly going to surface? Now, that's on them. But I would suggest that the rest of us also have a role to play in all of this, too. How we cover it, how we talk about it, will help shape the impressions of what's actually going on. So in that context, I stand before you here today to put a modest proposal on the table. You know how on the internet there is a thing called Godwin's Law, right? Which says that in any internet discussion, the first person who compares their opponents to Hitler or the Nazis loses, right? In other words, if you go to nukes, particularly too early in the conversation, then you should be out of the discussion. Well, my proposal about punditry on the Senate is somewhat similar. I want to propose that, especially in the early stages of the Senate, right? So for the first two weeks, at least, okay, anybody who charges another participant in the process with either heresy or rigidity, they lose. Okay, they should just be disqualified from any further commentary. And I picked these two terms deliberately because heresy is what the right is most likely to accuse the left of as this process unfolds. Rigidity is what liberals are most likely to accuse conservatives of. These terms are trafficked way too much already, and frankly, they are substitutes for thought. They are a way to a priori dismiss somebody else's perspective or concerns rather than taking it seriously. My modest proposal, ladies and gentlemen, is that we declare a moratorium on that vocabulary at least until, oh hell, I don't know, the third week of the Senate. Now, do I believe anybody's actually going to do that? No. I am 100% confident that nobody is going to listen to this, but nevertheless, I want it on record that I made the proposal because once these terms start flying around in the air and it becomes abundantly clear that they are gunking up the discussion rather than contributing to it, I want somebody to remember that there was an invitation to take a higher road. All right, fourth up this week, a family affair. So this past Sunday, there was a remarkable event in Poland, an entire family was beatified. We are talking about the Ulma family, parents Joseph and Victoria, and their seven children. They were beatified because between the winter of 1942 and March of 1944, in the small Polish farming community where they lived, they chose to shelter eight Jews in their attic 
despite the fact that the Nazi occupiers of Poland had issued a decree that anyone caught sheltering Jews would be subject to summary execution. Well, that's precisely what happened. On March 24, 1944, the Germans raided the Ulma farm. They discovered the Jews in the attic, and the members of the Ulma family were all executed, shot to death by the Nazis. It was originally believed, actually, that what had happened is that the two parents and six living children were killed in addition to one unborn child still in the womb of Victoria Ulma. However, on September 5th, the Vatican's Dicastery for the Causes of Saints issued a clarification that, in fact, what historical accounts indicate is that the shock of the executions, of, of what was about to happen, induced labor in Victoria, and that, so she was actually in the process of giving birth when she was shot to death, and that the head and the chest of her child were discovered outside the womb when the bodies were finally found after the executions had taken place. So this was actually a seventh living child as opposed to six children and an unborn child. This would have been the first time an unborn child had been beatified, but in fact, apparently, based upon the historical evidence, that is not the case. Now, here's the thing. There has been criticism of this beatification in some quarters, particularly inside Poland itself, because there are some who believe that Poland's conservative law and justice government is using the Olmas to kind of paper over Poland's troubled history when it comes to anti-Semitism. Many historians will say that Poland has historically had this sort of cancer of anti-Semitism within itself, particularly in more traditional Catholic quarters of Poland. And the idea is that this is a kind of public relations exercise intended to gloss over all of that. Now, I think here's the way to make sense of this all. Two questions. One, is it true that Poland, like many other parts of the world, many parts of the Catholic Christian world, has a checkered past with regard to anti-Semitism. Of course it is, and that should never be ignored or forgotten. Does that, in any sense, lessen the nobility, the magnificence, the heroism of the sacrifice made by the Olma family? Of course it doesn't. Look, the Catholic Church, as James Joyce once said, is here comes everybody, or to paraphrase Whitman, we are large, we contain multitudes. If you want, you can always make a case for villainy in the Catholic Church, and it won't be fake. We are always going to have villains in our midst. But if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, you will also find the very best of the human spirit in the bosom of the Catholic Church, and the Ulma story triumphantly puts an exclamation point on that truth. Finally, this week, finding a home. So. Recently, the Times of London published a piece about a controversy regarding an Opus Dei-run shrine in the Spanish locality of Torre Ciudad. It's one of the more important Marian shrines in Spain. It's the only one that is run directly by Opus Dei. In response to this coverage, the spokesman for Opus Dei in Great Britain, a good friend of mine, actually, by the name of Jack Valero, posted a video to Twitter, well, I guess it's not Twitter anymore, to X, I'm sorry, but this just seems ridiculous to me. But in any event, post, I mean, we gotta go all prints on this. He posted a video to the social media platform previously known as Twitter, basically rebutting this Times of London story, which he described as totally inaccurate. Now, that's not really all that interesting. What is of interest? is that in the context of this video, Valero took up the suggestion made in the Times article that recent changes made by Pope Francis to church law, in effect, have changed the nature of the category of a personal prelature, which is the category that Opus Dei uniquely currently occupies in church law. Basically, what Valero said boils down to this that the vision of St. Jose Maria Escrivá, the founder of Opus Dei, is that Opus Dei would be an organization that would bring together women and men. It would bring together celibate people and married people. It would bring together clergy and laity 
all sharing the same vocation and all being part of the same organization. Now, at the beginning, there was no category in church law that corresponded to that idea. Opus Dei thought it had found its home in 1982 when John Paul created it as a personal prelature. However, just a few months later, John Paul also signed off on a new revision of the Code of Canon Law that said that personal prelatures are primarily associations of priests. So ever since, there has been this tension. Are lay people actually members of Opus Dei or aren't they? And part of what is behind that is critics of Opus Dei believe that what the organization wants to do is take their lay members out from under the jurisdiction of the local diocese and the local bishop, thereby creating a kind of church within a church, right? Or a kind of parallel church. Now, Opus Dei has always denied that. Valero did that again in this video. He said that as far as the ordinary life of the church goes, Opus Dei laity are fully under the jurisdiction of the local diocese and bishop, just like anybody else. They come under the jurisdiction of Opus Dei merely for the unique spiritual formation that is part of the group. But in any event, Valero acknowledged that Pope Francis seems to have adopted the position held by Italian Jesuit Cardinal Gianfranco Ghirlanda, one of the premier canon lawyers of our time, that a personal prelature really is just priests and clergy, and that laity can be affiliated with it, but they can't actually be members of it. And what Valero said is, well, if that is what Pope Francis wants, if that is indeed how this is going to play out, then Opus Dei might have to move on. That is, it might have to find some other category in church law as yet to be determined. Basically, what Valero said is that when Jose Maria Escrivá, now Saint Jose Maria Escrivá, when he arrived in Rome in the 1940s, he was told that he got there a hundred years too soon. And Valera said, maybe we're still too soon for there to be some recognition in church law of this basic idea that women, men, celibate, married, clergy, laity can all be part of the same reality, sharing, equally sharing the same vocation. We will see how all this plays out, but what it suggests is that for all those who felt that the canonical years in the wilderness of Opus Dei were ended for all time by John Paul II in 1982, well, recent changes would suggest that maybe not so much. Maybe that journey is going to continue. All right, that is our show for this week. You can find full coverage of all of these stories on the Crux site. That is cruxnow.com. Again, cruxnow.com your one-stop shopping destination for the very best in smart, wired, and independent Catholic journalism. We will be back here next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. We'll full coverage of all the latest and greatest on the Vatican beat. In the meantime, I invite you to stay safe, stay healthy, have a fantastic and blessed week, and we will talk to you again very soon.